welcome to another episode of House of Decline, the podcast about general interest things, uh, I, uh, people on the internet who interest me and who have cool jobs and uh, who talk real good. And we have another one of those people. It's Amber Carr, blood at Bloodberry Tart. Uh, she's a streamer. She's a musician. How are you doing, Amber? Hi, I'm doing really well. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I, I'm glad to have you on the show. I've followed you on Twitter for a while. You're always saying things that I agree with about Bloodborne and such. <laughs> always I making incisive Bloodborne. Bloodborne. I love How can you not? Though? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like one of the most perfect games that anyone's ever made. Yeah, I mean, it's just thematically. I mean, we could just turn this into a Bloodborne. But we could yeah, we just could go talk off about, and talk we, about yeah. FromSoft right now. But um, yeah, we'll get into that eventually because it's part and parcel to, you know, how you came up as a streamer. And that's what yeah. I really want to talk about now is the streaming economy or how it's this huge <laughs> entertainment thing that is just totally fucking passed me by. But a few episodes ago, a couple episodes ago, I was talking to Rob Denblaker of Cyanide and Happiness. Um, yeah. And he was talking about how the streamer guys that he meets at cons, the streamer people, they are the hardest working motherfuckers yes. in town. Yeah. And it's like you think, uh, oh, you do this job because you're some sort of feckless gamer. No, <laughs> no. you, you got to put a lot you, of yourself you into it. You think that that's why you do it. That's why yeah. I got into it. I was like, oh, I love to be a feckless gamer. And I started yeah. going, man, this is all this work and shit. Yeah, like I got a friend, my friend Taffy, McLaffy Taffy on Twitch. He streams 40 hours a week. That's the time he is live. That's not counting the time that he is preparing stuff for stream or afterward or talking with sponsors or talking to his lawyer or whatever. Uh, you figure that's 40 hours of active performance. It's like yeah. you can't like just sit around uh, with like your resting bitch face on clicking on stuff like you can at an office job you're on the whole time and it's like in addition to the fact that you are uh spending a lot of time off stream that you're not getting paid for doing stuff to prepare for stream it's also just like a job that you can never not be like actively engaging with you can now you can't really passively do your job when you're a mm -hmm. streamer uh and that adds a certain level i think of like challenge to it that i think a lot of people don't expect i certainly didn't expect when i got into the space mm-hmm uh, you should program an AI version of you that can take over for hours at a time and just, you know, says, that would be a, that's actually a good idea. I should do that. <laughs> well, it's, if it's just my voice, it's ethical. Cause I, I, I would be the one making it and using yeah. it. <laughs> do a little soundboard, you know, an automated soundboard that just says you various like cool or yeah, exactly. Uh, I, you, what are, do you, you have you catchphrases? Of your. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> one of your patented Ambicar catchphrases, you exactly. know, like cool gaming time. <laughs> uh, um but yeah that that really that consistency that um endless grind aspect of it that seven days a week you know you got to be on because the audience will turn to something else if you don't provide their entertainment yeah um yeah what, do you're, you you're... do you feel that sometimes or is that part of the thrill i absolutely feel that sometimes <laughs> especially when i'm like like i'm working on the podcast Stole tenders now as well uh, and there uh, be times where it's like, uh, man, I got all this stuff to do for this other project, but I need to also be streaming. And you you get into this because like when you're streaming, you're not just competing for someone's attention; you're competing for someone's attention in a specific time slot. Yeah, like it's it's like a live performance. Like they most like people watch VOD video on demand from streams, but most of the time, your most of your viewers are going to be live, mm -hmm. and so you're not just like competing with the general milieu of like what time they may have free or whatever you're competing with, like directly with everything that's happening at that time. Mm -hmm. So like all the other streamers and also like, just like every other kind of entertainment ever made. And it's for a specific time block. And so like, you really have to bring in a, a game as far as like consistency and energy mm -hmm. to continue to attract an audience. And like, I like scaled my stream back a little bit, uh, as I've been working on skull tenders to make sure that I can hit everything I need to for that goal and like still keep the stream going and it's hard it's like it's exhausting like i stream about two or three days a week right now which is way down from what i was doing just because the amount of work that it is and the amount of energy that it is really burn you out if you're not careful oh yeah well i i know about that overproduction in that same episode with rob i talked about how just in the first two years i was doing 1500 comics uh, yeah, yeah, I did it. But it might, I mean, my, I, they were like really simplistic. I didn't ink, I did scrub, but you know, that's like, 
you, if you want to do the creative thing and you get really weirdly ambitious about it, as, as a bunch of us did at the beginning of COVID, COVID, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, you just start doing that. Oh, I'm never going to get tired ever. I can do this. I don't yeah. have a regular job anymore. This is my job now. I'm going to commit to it. You know, and uh, it's going to be a thousand years streaming. I'll, I'll do this forever. I'll stream when I'm asleep. No, but <laughs> eventually, you know, it catches up with you. You can't. Keep yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. That's like what really gets challenging. It's like once it does become your job mm -hmm. and it moves to the side of your brain, that's maybe not your passion. It's your job. Yeah, you really have to find a way to reignite that passion because the the grind will burn you out otherwise. It's so yeah. easy, like any kind of, and that's not just experience, like any kind of creative work. Oh, yeah. it's like very easy to uh, to burn yourself out, especially when like I have a belief that the human brain was really not meant to judge us in communities that consisted of the entire world. And so it's really easy to feel like you're failing when you go on the internet and you see somebody who is like 1000 times bigger than you. Yeah. Because I don't think that our brains were ever really meant to comprehend that. Yes. Um, well, yeah, I mean, that, that's the other thing is the big stratification with the streamers. There's like the three of the, the top ones that have like a billion views. And then there's like, uh, the sort of middle class, you're in the middle class of streamers, you know? Yeah, <laughs> you're in the, exactly. Uh, yeah, which is, uh, you know, real, real, uh, uh, I'm trying to find the word. What would they, how would they describe it in sports? You know, scrappy, you know? <laughs> not, yeah, exactly. Not, yeah. But, um, yeah, you're not, who are the, who are the big, I know Hassan is the only streamer I know. And he seems like Hassan okay. XQC. Who's that? That guy seems weird. I'm from, I only the have thing like is these vague most impressions. Of them of are guy. weird. Imagine yeah. like, so, so imagine for a moment, think about gamers, right? Yeah. Imagine what an amalgamation of what the average gamer is like. Yeah. Uh, but then you turn the knob all the way up. That's like okay. what you get with most of the top streamers. And so that we ever wonder like, wow, it sure seems like a, a lot of these guys at the top are like weird jerks. Yeah. That's why, <laughs> because that's, you know, yeah, he's watching them. But, uh, Hassan seems to be a nice exception. Yeah, he nice seems, he seems all right. I don't, I don't mind him. I'll tell you the one fella who I never investigated, but I get these impressions of through Titter that it's just like, man, I fucking hate this guy. It's fucking destiny. I hate that. Oh, guy yeah, so yeah, much. Destiny sucks. He's, he's the worst guy on You know, in terms of like, um, something and it, it's sad because there's many great streamers out there like you, like, mm -hmm. uh, uh, who are, you know, basically just committing to a live theater talk show thing. Yeah, exactly. That's, it's that's kind of like, like being a radio host. Yeah. It's a, it's a call in. Do you do like call in format stuff as well? Or I'll, you... I'll bring guests on and stuff sometimes. I yeah. don't do call in just because it's becomes very unpredictable that and it's recorded <laughs> yeah. live. Yes. You have a lot less control over, like, you can't just be, well, I'll just edit that weird shit that that guy said out oh yeah yeah you have to be I've a little more that. careful than that yeah I, I do a lot of twitter spaces and i get quite a few mentally ill people so <laughs> yeah i can imagine uh which is good i like talking to him but uh, you you're doing <laughs> you're putting on a show so uh, having it be more of a like a talk show type deal makes sense yeah um, but yeah, that, that sort of, that, there's that aspect to it. And I get that. That makes more sense. I would watch something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and I've, I have watched streams before where say like a bunch of like podcasters, I like do a stream for something. Yeah. But, no, it's not in my wheelhouse usually, but the politics streamer stuff is so mystifying to me. Like, how do you watch someone read a Wikipedia page? Like, I fundamentally do not understand the appeal. Like, clearly, it's a very popular niche right now. A yeah. lot of people I know and people who are my friends are doing quite well in that space. I do not understand the appeal uh, to listen to it. And it also sounds agonizing for me to do it. Yes. Um, I think that maybe uh, it is easier for a certain demographic who is not usually like, the target of vitriol within politics to do yeah. it. Like I, I think most of the politics streamers I know are like, you know, white guys. I think there's a yeah. reason for that. Uh -huh. uh, you don't have to read <laughs> hateful things about you specifically really ever. Um, and I think that maybe that helps a bit, but I can't imagine like, I, I think there's a reason there's not a lot of women doing. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that is the quality of sort of like those aggro Ben Shapiro esque politics streamers or like, I mean, that's what destiny is like every impression of this guy. He is the exact same personality as Ben Shapiro, but from a centrist liberal yes. perspective. Exactly. So it's like, 
But I, I get the appeal of that because it's about like rhetorical dominance. It's not about, yes. you know, consensus building. It's about, you know, that's it's like my big brother is going to call you, call you names and he's going to yeah, exactly. humiliate you rhetorically. Well, so whenever people are talking about debate, it's like, oh, well, why wouldn't you debate him? Like, oh, debate? You mean the sport for children? Yeah, yeah, the sport that they make little children in little private school shorts do. It's a, exactly. You know, my thesis statement is much better than yours, Alphonse. Exactly. Ad hominem, ad hominem. This poncy ass bullshit. Yeah, this is what we're supposed to. No, because I mean, respect that. Nah. <laughs> what it, you know, there's there's a word for for an exchange of ideas that uh, where you can partially convince someone. It's called a conversation, but you're not yeah. interested in that. <laughs> No, exactly. No one's yeah. interested in communicating with each other in those spaces. People yeah. are interested in uh, feeling right and feeling as though their ideas have defeated the other ideas in some sort of stupid combat. Yeah. My idea, Pokemon, go. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. My, I have a water idea, which is super effective against your uh, rock idea. Yeah. Um, no, it's yeah. like it's like a bunch of a bunch of like racism type trainers going out to the field <laughs> trying to like oh, it's like man come on. I uh, uh yeah you, you I use my racist type Pokemon original coloring Jinx. This is <laughs> just, yeah, just just Jinx. Yeah, regular it's, Jinx. Just, it's all regular. To, uh, uh, they had to. I'm glad they changed that. That was yeah. that was good of them for them to change. Uh jeez. Uh but that was one of those uh, ones I saw it young enough that I didn't get it and then I got older I was like, whoa, whoa. whoa I'm like whoa. You know, playing Japan like Japan is different. They got different values going on there. I mean that shit la I shouldn't say that. That shit lasted in North America up till like the nineties. Yeah, exactly. Doing those depictions like that. So we are no better. But uh uh freaking uh yeah, it, the, I think uh, I also want to talk about we're also on here to talk about skull tenders, which you've already yeah. talked about your new uh, new new ish. It's not. Yeah, it dropped in October. So it's pretty yeah. new. But uh, you're doing it with a lot of a lot of talented people. Casey Green, who will be on this show. I don't know when these episodes are going to come out, which order they're going to come out. But, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, it's it's got some names attached to it. It's a and d podcast. It is a and d podcast. Yes uh and what why why a dnd pod did, did you feel like with well, the low quality of other dnd podcasts were bought at night i guess i was better. you know it, it's like so what it was is like i had already liked uh dnd media before i think it's a, a good vehicle for uh improv comedy mm -hmm. i think it, it, uh because it's like you look at it, it's like the dice roll is your props it's like okay this thing is happening. You roll the dice. This is how you need to react to it. It's a nice uh, little format for like quick, short form, uh, like improv comedy, but that can also have like a world building aspect in the larger uh, part of the project, which I enjoy as well. And mm -hmm. so I came up on listening to stuff like uh, Acquisitions Incorporated and the Adventure Zone and like improv comedy shows that aren't necessarily D&D, &D, like Mission to Zix. Um, <laughs> and then we got to the, like, eventually it was just kind of was like, I had been enjoying this kind of media for a while and I had established myself enough as a streamer uh, that I was like, I had talked to Cohen and Casey about doing something like this when they were streaming as well as Game Worms, uh, which is no longer, now Casey just streams cartoons sometimes, which is great. I, I love when he does his streams. Mm -hmm. But uh, I reached out to them and we're like, do you want to do a podcast? Because it seems like a space that one people like want to hear stuff in. I was like at a panel at Magfest for like a bunch of uh, D and D podcasts that aren't even particularly big ones. Uh, they're good ones. It's like quid pro roll and uh, forgotten paths, but both of which are buddies of mine recommend people mm -hmm. check them out. But I was like, man, there's a lot of people here and it sounds like a lot of fun. And I have, you know, experience being quick and snappy and funny on stream all the time. I'm going to reach back out to these guys and put this together. And so I reached out to, you know, Casey green cartoonist uh, mm -hmm. behind like gun show and, anime club and whatnot and Cohen Edenfield, who's like a games writer who did like hive swap. He's worked on some stuff for Disney. Uh, and I was like, you guys want to do this? And they were into it. And, uh, Cohen reached out and picked up, uh, Jess O'Brien, uh, void burger on YouTube or like giant bomb alum. And, yeah. uh, yeah. Yeah. Another thing which passed me by, but everyone who I met says like giant bomb was the greatest show on earth. Mm -hmm. All those guys are legends. They're freaking mm -hmm. legends. Uh, from what yeah, I hear, but yeah, exactly. I, I never, I never, it's one of those things. I, I missed it completely. Yeah. I understand. It's, well, it's easy. There's so much on the internet. So much freaking stuff. 
I yeah. just found about Germa the other. There's some guy named Germa. Apparently, yeah, yeah Germa is one of the. Yeah, I should have named that when I was naming big streamers because he's one of the good ones. I really like him. He's really yeah, funny. yeah. He does. Yeah. Jim, he does Jim Carrey faces. I had the thing. I had the Homer Simpson moment where I was. Uh, you know where Homer Simpson's watching Barney. And he says, yeah. <laughs> two plus two is four. And mm-hmm. he says, <laughs> I get why this is so popular. Uh, <laughs> same thing with Germa, where it's like, I was watching him. It's like, why do people like this? It makes a face. And it's like, ah, yeah. <laughs> it's he's good. Uh, quite good. He's quite funny. There's a reason yeah, he's, he's popular. Got a good he got a good face. I see yeah. why people like him. And he's not, he doesn't seem to be a huge prick, which is. <laughs> yeah. And he's like making a ton of money and he's using it to do these like extremely bizarre and ambitious streams. Like he did the dollhouse stream where people could vote on what he'd do. And he had like a house built that only had one, had one of the front walls missing. So you could see into it like a dollhouse. Uh, it's yeah. Pushing the medium for in terms of exactly. like, as performance art, which it basically is. Uh, yeah. And he's like one of the best at that. He's like, like, oh, well, I have all this capital all of a sudden because my stream is so popular. Let me use it to do like, oh, I'm going to hire an entire baseball team to do this X thing. Like, you know, it's like, yeah. He's I mean, like, there's a much darker version of that with like Mr. Beast, but uh, Germa seems yeah. to be genuinely creative. Uh, it seems exactly. To have better ideas. It's, um, it is so lazy that they literally just called the Antichrist Mr. Beast. <laughs> what an incredible like fu- like no subtlety at all yeah like, yeah man. he will do he will come uh bringing good tidings pretending to do good works and in the end you know he's got that hey you know what mr beast i i don't <laughs> It's fine. It's honestly, I actually think it's fine, but it's just funny to say. There are, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I it's like the very joke. on the nose. Yeah, it's like yeah. This, this person who does these nightmarish and his smile, his dead-eyed sociopathic smile. He has a goatee. He's like giving away <laughs> money constantly. He's like obsessed with people seeing him as a good person, which seems like something the devil would do. But, you know, yeah, there's there's all these funny things to it. But uh, people legitimately believe Mr. Beast is Satan, which is. Uh, also... Yeah, that, I'm not quite on that level. Yeah. Um, he's no. just like a bit. He's just the current big YouTube guy, which is yeah. like, you know, it's not a crime. They'll come but, for uh, you all. It'll eventually like all capitalist industries, it'll hit peak growth and it will fade into sand like Aussie. Yeah, Andy's it'll be eventually. like anything else where it'll be like, well, if we don't worry about infinite growth, this is actually perfectly sustainable. And the market <laughs> will be like, no, actually, it's no. bad now. I mean, that's the problem with this whole thing where your whole model is based off of escalating stunts is yeah. like it, it was the same problem with epic meal time. Eventually you just made a meal. You couldn't make you couldn't make more epic meals. People had already seen a billion bacon float, you know, thing. Exactly. You know? Yeah. How much bacon can you put on stuff by the end? Yeah. Which is why you gotta get weirder with it. You have to explore different emotional aspects instead of just trying to out epic yourself constantly. Exactly. Yeah, and I think that's how you stay fresh. But like I got off uh, from the D and D I but from the D and D, so you're a musician as well. Um, yes. Do you like when you're creative, do you think you compose better collaboratively or solips or solo? Because I'm that's very actually, much solo person. Yeah. I actually prefer collaborative work. That's part of why I like put together skull tenders as a project. It was like, I missed working with other people mm-hmm. and like, it's nice to like sit down at a thing and be like, okay, we need an editor. Jess is really, really good at that. Jess is a great audio engineer. I have her yeah. do that. We need an artist. We got, fucking casey green which feels like having an in-house bill watterson we'll have him do this you know it's like it's nice to be able to to work with a group and divide up who was good at what and play off of each other uh for me i find that very creatively fulfilling and it's nice to work in something like uh podcasts because there's like similarities to music and like when you're creating an audio format piece of art or entertainment uh it's almost like it's like one dimensional. And I don't mean that as in like, it's one dimensional as in it's like, doesn't have any depth. I mean that like, and it's literally one dimensional. It moves uh, in one direction and people can only focus on one thing at one, uh, one time because it's audio really, you know, maybe two, uh, because you, you know, you're not showing them any images. You're not, you have to think very deliberately about the things you're showing them in the order that you're showing them. It's like, it's like you're showing somebody a room, but it's dark and you have a flashlight and you can point mm-hmm. it at any one thing at any given time, but you can only show them one thing. And there's other things that in the dark, they might remember them, but they don't mm-hmm. see them anymore. Yeah. And so there's like a, a delicate dance to creating something in audio medium, be it music or be it a podcast that I personally, since I have a lot of experience with feel very comfortable working within those constraints and making them into an advantage. And so it's like a lot of fun for me. Oh yeah. That's uh see, I very much, 
why well, I, I think why I would relate to a musician like Frank Zappa is if I did have a band, I would be extremely tyrannical over them and I wouldn't <laughs> allow them. I would be the main guy. I would be the composer. I have that. And it's why I could never get into D and D it's because I'm like, I can write better jokes than you. I can tell a better story than you, my idiot. Yeah. Friends. I have a very, nar- I have too much of a narcissistic personality to really commit myself to it effectively. Yeah. I'm for- fortunate that like Cohen is a very talented writer. So I don't really ever feel that way. Cohen's always saying stuff. And I'm like, Oh yeah, that's better than what I would have thought of. <laughs> <laughs> that's, you know, you sure are a professional writer and I'm just some asshole. So that works out. <laughs> well, you know, some asshole is the key to making a D&D game funny because some exactly. asshole is, is what uh, creates the unexpected, the, the little humor. So you, it's very much in the humor because some people take their D&D shit. I mean, OK, so I'm not going to hate on a critical role. <laughs> this is not. Yeah, I don't no, think but like you what you're saying. There's two schools. There's like yeah. the comedy school and like the world building school of yeah. D&D media. And so we try to I would say we're primarily the the comedy school what we're really trying to do is it's like a show that's com- uh, primarily comedy driven mm-hmm. but the world building like is consistent and matters so like yeah. we will like because it's edited and stuff like we will go back and make sure that everything works and lines up uh narratively and within the world building of the world like uh so it never feels like nothing matters and it's just like a, a shifting landscape that only exists for jokes like it, it all exists within a consistent world Mm-hmm. But the show is ultimately about it being funny and fun before it is about that. Will you go for but, Will there be an emotional gut punch at one point? Will one yes, character yes, die? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there yeah, is some of that. Yeah. Well, the way stakes. the Skulltenders is set up is everyone in Skulltenders is like already dead and is being returned to life to fight necromancers and bring back ghosts that refuse to go to the afterlife. And so because of how that works, like us just all getting killed is like on the table for every episode. Ah. And like, yeah, and so like, it's very, it's it's very Dark Souls. It's very from yes. soft, you know, the curse, undead exactly. curse, undead curse. It's yeah, happening. precisely. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I know I love that aspect about it because you know this is these. I think the reason why FromSoft games hit so much is that's what it sort of feels like now. Talk about like streaming seven days a week and you know just mm-hmm. being beholden as the puppet to capitalism. We're all experiencing the undead curse now. Yeah, you exactly. Got zombies fighting necromancers. Yeah, well, and it's also like you got to create a problem. I find with like a lot of this kind of D and D media is people are too precious about their characters, and so there's no stakes ever. Yeah, because it's like nothing bad's actually going to happen to these people because they're going to need this performer in the next episode. You know, they're on the LLC paperwork; they need to be in the next episode, so they can't. Nothing bad can actually happen to them. And the format of school tenders is like explicitly designed so that bad stuff could happen to us. There's like a horror edge to it, and that oh, very yeah. intentionally. That's very cool. And I mean, the other thing is, um, you can bring in new characters. To, once you once you kill someone off, you have an opportunity yeah. to get someone new and keep the show fresh as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, because there are only so many characters a D and D podcast can handle before it starts to become unruly. I suppose, like uh, yeah, we're and we're a small party on purpose for that. Like it's yeah. three players and a DM, and we, so it's like we're a five person team. It's like we have Cohen writes it and DMs. Jess is the, the audio engineer and plays Visk. Casey is the artist and plays Doo-Doo. I, I am like the, yeah, doo the owl, right? It's yeah. an extremely Casey Green type character. Of course, of course. Yeah, he, he actually is edited differently from all the other characters, whereas everyone else has normal sound effects. He uses almost exclusively like Hanna-Barbera classic sound effects, <laughs> uh, which is go. really fun. Jess does a really good job on that. Uh, and so I do like the like, you know, networking and promotion. I go to all the cons. I'm booking us all on all the podcasts, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And I play Felicity. And then we have Seth, who is our, we have, he scores the show. They're like our dedicated composer, writes new music for the show and, and soundscapes for the show uh, for every single episode. There you and go. It, it's cool. It's a lot of you fun to team. work. Yeah, no, it's like a really. You did a whole small, Ocean's like, Eleven thing. You did a yeah, whole. Yeah, no, it's, your, it's your really what it feels like. Gang together, yeah. We assembled the team like very intentionally to be like a powerhouse. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it is, it's a lot of fun working in that kind of uh, small team like that that gives us like a very tight show because the cast is small. But also, like, there's like a lot of talent behind it, so it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I, yeah, I need to. I should do something collaborative, but then people will be touching my stuff all the time. It's the same reason why I've never gotten a cleaner. Don't touch my stuff. I don't want you to. <laughs> um, which is, um, you know, not the way you should do it. You should work collaboratively. I, I think it's generally 
even if even if you are the most solipsistic person on earth like your ideas become better if you bounce them off of other people Always. yeah exactly and it's not like act like they're it's never hard it's like I'm, I'm sure all of us have gotten into arguments about something here and there at some point mm-hmm. but in the long run it's just like you get a much better product if you have a lot of other talented people around you and i feel very fortunate to work on something like skull tenders where it's like everybody who is doing what they do i can't think of somebody i'd rather be doing it oh you yeah oh uh, yeah you got i mean i think that's like i one of the aspects of streaming especially and i think that in that in that video of uh, uh, the H bomber guy video about speed running sort of alludes to this, but I, I, I syncretized that with uh, my Adam, my love of Adam Curtis <laughs> documentaries <laughs> where I don't know, people are looking for, a, you know, what is the next thing? You know, what is the, this movement after the, the neoliberalism has uh, collapsed and, you know, we are left with these bifurcating forces of socialism and clown fascism sort of clashing at each other in the ensuing uh environmental apocalypse but but so what comes out right and uh, adam curtis uh in can't get you out of my head um and then in hypernormalization before that what i liked about those movies is that they don't characterize the 20th century necessarily as a clash between capitalism and communism but rather of broader ideologies between individualism and uh collectivism yeah, and that's what I find interesting about streaming or speed running is, is it's emerging between those ideas, this sense of individualism and collectivism at the same time, as is yeah. the proverbial Ocean's Eleven group, like you said. Yeah, because it's, speed running is a good example of how those can intersect in a way that I think is you social and yeah. a positive, which is that like, sure, everyone's individual time is their individual time, right? Mm -hmm. But nobody, almost everybody in those gets faster because of the sharing of information between uh, different speedrunners. If somebody finds a new glitch that allows them to, uh, you know, shave a second off their time, which can be quite a bit in a Mm speedrun, depending on the game, like, they tell people that. They tell people how to do it. They post the videos from their streams and they say what they did and like why it works and people figure it out together collaboratively. And then that information is disseminated to individual streamers who can then like practice their individual craft to see how like how well that they can accomplish that uh, on an individual level. And I think that's like a really healthy you social way to have an individualist uh, hobby. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, I mean, not, I don't think we have to model our entire society off of speed running communities. I think that would be uh, disastrous, but um, I know. Um, but I, I think that's where a lot of like, if you're in socialist circles, if you're in left wing circles, I think you sort of um, sometimes you get into the trap of like, uh, should I only dress in burlap and do ultimate degrowth and, you know, live on a yeah. commune and like, you know, sublimate myself to the mass group and do the gadfly and, you know, but, you know, I think something that you discover, especially as a queer person, you know, as a mm-hmm. theatrical queer person, oh, I like being a little expressive, you know, I like, you guys can't me. see it, but we're all do- we're both we're doing, doing hands. jazz hands right yeah, now. We're doing, yeah, we're doing a lot of stuff with our hands right now. Hands, yeah. Um, but, so it's like there, and that's also sort of alluded to in the Adam Curtis documentary where he talks about sort of these negative aspects of capital capitalist individualism. But one of the sort of more positive things is he talks about uh, trans women living in the seventies and how the assertion of that individualism against this sort of negative encroaching uh, fascist version, neo-fascist version of collectivism that was taking hold in England in the seventies at that time was actually sort of, uh, a use of that ideology that didn't seem toxic or poisonous, that sort of broad ideological concept of individualism could function in a way that was healthier, you know, which is something that I liked about that documentary. Yeah. Cause you got to walk the line, like to make like, if you're collectivist in your thought and ideology to take care to not be like, well, I'm someone who wants to enforce a monoculture, mm-hmm. you know? Cause that's like how you could, that's, I think that's like the dark, the dark road you can go down with that ideology that is not good. And I, I think that that's by far not the norm these days. For no the more tender queers. We're killing all the tender. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Or the people who are like, ah, well, clearly socialism works best. Is everyone in this country is the same race. Yes. Like, let's, there are know, a lot of those guys out there. I, exactly. Those guys are fucking weird. <laughs> yeah, I don't like but them. Like, yeah, exactly. And I think it's like, there's a, I think that uh, there's a component of of like 
expressive individuality that is very healthy to balance with your uh macro side economic collectivism yeah yeah uh, but at the same time, you know, you, there's always that prompt of like, what's your job on the commune? And we can't all be streamers. On the exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. Like, and especially, anime appraiser. Yeah. Yeah. If you're in, especially if you're in the media industries, uh, sometimes it can be a little harder to like justify, but you know, then you realize, no, we're, we exist in a hyper-capitalized society. There is a place for me in this mm -hmm. world. Um, and if we do go to the commune, I don't think whatever socialism looks like in the future, I don't think it's going to be the commune. I, I certainly hope not. It also just kind of is like, I would think that in a world where we are efficiently like spreading out research, like there's clearly, we can make enough food and enough housing without everybody doing those things. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think. Yeah. I mean, also I'm not married to leisure or something, but you need a little of it, right? You need like the art is good. Yeah. Right? We want yeah. it. Um, maybe not with the overproduction we have. I mean, that's the problem with the overproduction mentality too, is because then you get people uh, who are making AI art and stuff who are completely. Oh God. Which is just like, look at all this garbage stuff. I've dumped onto the, onto the floor, man. People okay, love yeah. doing it, but there's a lot of it. There's so much of it. It's but it's, yes. it's a huge amount. It's huge. Look how so much so that sometimes you are astonished by a gigantic pile of feces, like the yeah, dinosaur exactly. feces in, in Jurassic. Wow, there is so much of this fucking shit. I can't mm -hmm. believe how much inane fucking dog shit there is out there. Yeah. Um. But yeah, the way I I have vowed to compete with it is that if you create anything unique or honest or idiosyncratic in some way i think people will notice it more now because yeah. there is such just gray nonsense out there that was a thing that like i take a little solace in is like i don't think that an ai could replicate like school tender what school tenders does with world building is and with the fact that it is like a very direct confluence between a, a lot of creatives uh I don't think that it could be replicated by AI, at least not this time. I don't see how it could be. I yeah. do take a little bit of comfort in that and that like creating something that is not particularly derivative in a space that uh, could very easily be like, it's, it, it's very easy to just like, well, time to make another Lord of the Rings when you make a piece of fantasy media yeah. uh, to stray away from that and try to make something truly unique. Uh, I think has the extra payoff now of like yeah. people can't just auto generate the incredibly unique thing you've been working on. Look, I don't want to talk smack about Octopath Traveler, but <laughs> it's not, I like Octopath Traveler, but man, those stories are super generic in that game, which is fine. Yeah. I like a super generic fantasy story, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, a lot it's of not just what you want, honestly. Like, I, yeah. I still have media like that that I enjoy. Quite oh, a yeah, bit. yeah. It's not, if you want a Brandon Sanderson, you want to get a Brandon Sanderson. Mm -hmm. You want to do any, is he the guy who's the guy that writes the incredibly, like, has the intense output of incredibly generic fantasy stories? Oh. <sighs> I don't know. I don't know. These I, don't know. I don't know these people, but, uh, either way. Um, yeah. What is that? What is that love of that generic sword and sorcery fantasy? Why do people, why do you think people find that? Cause I, if I ever do D and D, if I listen to a podcast or whatever, it's going to be the funny variety as yes. opposed to, and I like it when there's world building. Obviously I like it when there's sort of like a consistent story and there are some stakes because that can make the jokes funnier through character interaction. Yeah. And like you are, in my opinion, you earn the stakes through being a funny and enjoyable podcast first. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, like you, people can get to the point where they care about the characters and care about uh, the world through comedy, as opposed to you trying to beat them over the head with uh, how important everything is. Well, yeah. Um, and so I think I agree that it's like, it's kind of worth it to try to create that world being, but as to why people like that, like classic, uh, sword and sorcery kind of thing, I think a lot of it is just like, uh, you know, people want to be a hero or they want to be exist in this fantasy realm that they have a, uh, already have a pretty idea of what the constraints of the world are and what they're getting into. Yeah. And then you come into it feeling already like, okay, I know how to be this kind of hero. I've seen Lord of the Rings or I've read enough, you know, D and D splat books, or I've read enough Red Wall, or whatever. Maybe yeah. your choice of media. You watch watch uh, Dungeon Meshy. 
uh, <laughs> people, you know, they come into it with some, some idea of how the framework of the world works. And I think that that's enjoyable. And that's part of why, like, while school tenders is like a pretty weird and ambitious world, mechanically, it does run on D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. Part of that is so that like people can come in and you, they might not know anything about the world or the characters in it yet, but they know that like, okay, these jokes are funny and the way that the show works mechanically is familiar to me because it's based on the most popular tabletop system in the world. So in a way, it's like Commedia dell'arte. It's like, yes. it's like Pantalone and can be, we have all these archetypes and we know what these archetypes are. Oh, he is the, he is the sycophantic butler to the wealthy man. Exactly. We know this archetype already. Um, but yeah, I, I like that idea that there is some sort of like rules based structure that people can easily understand so that they can get into stories uh, a, a little easier. I think that's cool. Yeah, exactly. I think that it's, it's the, uh, cause that's the thing I enjoyed about like, when you understand that like the the superstructure that the rpg gives to the narrative it it's interesting and it's fun to like you hear when you hear the dice roll and hear the number and know that it's going to break bad a second before it breaks bad it, it almost feels like you have a bit of insider knowledge and i think it's enjoyable to people or it's fun to like like school tenders reflavors everything like from dnd &D because it's a pretty different world from dnd &D. yeah um but it's fun for like someone like me like who uh, it's, having come from video games before tabletop uh, is a bit of like a mechanics freak. It's yeah. fun to be like, ooh, 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 I know what class that is. I know what they can do. I figured it out. I, I feel <laughs> smart. I'm a smart and good boy. Uh, like That's very decks. exciting. I can max decks. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think that that's fun for a lot of people too. I think it's, uh, and I think that it's important when you make a piece of narrative media that is uh, a little bit more out there to give people at least something that they're familiar with to grip onto. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely like i think because the truth is people always say they want something new and they do to some degree but i think what most people really want is they want something that they at least kind of know they already like presented in an extremely novel way yeah they want, well, to, they want to have a starting foothold yeah think about avatar the last airbender four mm -hmm. elements you already know them you, you exactly get, uh, you, you, you understand the archetype oh there's an air guy and they're soft and billowy oh there's fire guys and they're aggressive yeah exactly yeah it takes uh very generalized concepts you already know mm -hmm. uh, and can lead you nicely into them and it, then it gives them the option to like reinforce those assumptions or subvert them and both of those are interesting in their own way when you create a narrative like that but yeah the main point is it's not like they showed up and they made four elements that you've never heard of yeah uh you know yeah there's not ass they didn't ass yeah uh, or genies uh, exactly. It's like, man, I wonder what those, skins, you I know, wonder what the these fuck are the those four do. elements, you know, <laughs> exactly. And like, but even like that, like if you've established enough stuff that people already know, you can maybe the, you do make those your elements and that's the twist. There you like, go, like yeah. an example I can think of is uh, like Warhammer 40k. Yeah. Warhammer 40k has the four chaos gods. Uh, and you would probably think it's like, uh, you know, war, pestilence, famine. It's like, no, it is, it is hatred disease sensation and change sure yeah, that's yeah like, I, love, it, I love it, it when it's just six cons it's like the infinity gauntlet it's like the six stones and sure it's mind there's infinity yeah whatever who cares yeah yeah, yeah i like and it's fun like as long as and that works with the infinity gauntlet because the idea superhero is already mm -hmm. established in your brain so it's like you have your foothold already so you can get weirder with the other stuff i think mm -hmm. that's like a good guideline to creating a piece of narrative media mm-hmm yeah uh well yeah in the sense that if you're trying to create like a story that has brought obviously that's not the only way you can create a story you know you no, can create course. something that's very off-putting or very deliberately challenging but that's not usually the purpose of a D, &D podcast uh comedy D, &D yeah podcast. And, the, and the thing <laughs> also is like it's i think it's easier to make something more challenging like that in a visual medium where people can see it and they can just go, yeah. ah, that's the thing. If you're making something an audio medium, to some degree, you have to relate it. Even if it's a unique world, like Skull Tenders uh, is pretty out there as far as the D D setting goes. Uh, it's sort of uh, this weird, like, anime Grim Fandango kind of world. Yeah. Uh, but you have to, like, give people at least some things they can imagine in their brain. Uh, so, yeah. like, taking things that people are familiar with and subverting or recontextualizing them in, in ways that they've never experienced before, I think is a really effective way to make like an audio drama. See the, I, now I just have, I have like a, 
a funny idea of like this experimental D and D podcast <laughs> that like, it's like, it was like the Hijo Kaiden of D and D podcasts. <laughs> you know, it was like, it was like the goddamn, you know, it was like the John cage of D and D. I was going to say, yeah, it's right. the Godspeed you black emperor. Of D&D podcast. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And, and it would be funny if someone, uh, raves about that, that who, whatever the pitchfork media RIP that rates D and D podcast, because Lord knows there, there's enough of them that you could probably have a whole website just devoted. To- <laughs> yeah. Easily. <laughs> yeah. But it, I think it's fun every time because it's like, um, I, I remember just reading about the original D and D and how, uh, Gary Gygax, he was spending so much time away from his wife playing war games that his wife thought he was having an affair and then she bursts <laughs> down into the basement and she finds a bunch of guys playing like little war games with dice. And I just imagined him like looking over his shoulder with his little seventies ponytail and be like, it's not what it looks like. It's yeah. not what, it looks like. but it's that, that sort of moment of you have a whole other world going on. And it's one of this surprising social warmth because you found this sort of mutual obsession over what is essentially a mathematical game. Yes. Which is, uh, very funny that it's this very deliberate mathematical thing that is bonding you all together. Yeah, because yeah, because D and D grew out of D and D is like especially crunchy among tabletop games too, as far as numbers, because it grew out of uh, Gary Gox, Gygax's love of war games, like you said. It grew out of mm-hmm. a game called Chainmail, and uh, so it's very numbers heavy. Uh, and some people, it depends what school you come from. Like uh, if you come from a background in improv, some people prefer a simpler system, like Powered by the Apocalypse or something like that. Mm-hmm. But as somebody who's like comes from like you know obviously i have my comedy experiences with streaming and uh whatnot but i uh also come from like a tactics game pervert background <laughs> uh, i love how many numbers are in D. I love to roll a bunch of dice i like to look at the chart and go ooh when i get mm. you know when i get gelf's acid hands you guys are really gonna be in trouble <laughs> like you know like that that's fun to me i enjoy that and i think i think that a lot of people enjoy that kind of thing they like the uh i think that on some level when you're doing improv already and you're doing it for the context of a game like mm-hmm. D, it adds a certain level of like gravity and reward to when you do something really cool that it was constrained by a system you couldn't just say like oh i do the cool thing and it works mm-hmm. you know sometimes you you have to do something like something some of the coolest things that can happen to you or things that are of a very low probability Mm-hmm. And one of the nice things about doing a podcast is that when I roll a one and fail horribly, it is just as good for the show as if I rolled a 20. <laughs> yeah. Even if it is not good for your character. No, but it's entertaining. And it's like, you know, you're trying to make a performance. And so you don't really like when one of us hits a one. I don't really feel like we failed at anything. It's like, oh, good. This is going to be great for the show. This is going to be great radio. Yeah. Good old po- podcasting, goddamn friend. If it ain't all about that podcasting with your goddamn friend, I mean, that's the other problem is I'm a podcaster. Yeah. And sometimes you take a step back and look at yourself as like, I'm a podcaster. Can I, yeah. can I call myself that? I mean, it's what I do, but it's terrible. And I'm every stereotype of a podcaster. This is know? why I'm always saying, I'm like, oh, radio drama, radio, radio play. This sure yeah. sounds way better than saying podcaster. Yeah, I, I mean, that's what's so fucking irritating about podcaster. It's an advertisement for Apple in the name, even though it's mm-hmm. not even that any, why are we still calling them podcasts? Can we just call it radio? It's just fucking it. radio. Yeah, it's, it is. It's just yeah. digital radio, basically. Yeah. Why can't we call it that? No, we have to call it pod, which sounds dumb. And everyone <laughs> has a podcast where it's, they have pod in the fucking name. Like, and it's, there's always a pod pun and I hate all of them. Yeah. yeah it's pretty good. bad. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I think, um, I deserve my career in media because, uh, frankly, I'm great at it. <laughs> yeah, that's what matters. The thing yeah. about careers in media is that they're exclusively given to people who deserve them, and everyone who doesn't have one doesn't deserve it. Exactly, exactly. There's no such thing as somebody who has uh, failed upward through mediocrity. Yeah, exactly. And there's no such thing as somebody who is an incredible talent that just isn't respected by their medium. Yes. Yes. That never, that never, ever occurs. Uh, inside Lewin <laughs> Davis, the point was that Lewin Davis sucked. Then that's why yeah. <laughs> if you've ever seen that movie. The point is he sucked. Um, which, you know, the movie sort of establishes by showing that he was basically equivalent to Marcus Mumford. Ho! No. Whoa! 
Well, they use Marcus Mumford in the folk music if, to, to do some of the songs in that movie, which I always thought was funny because it's um, Mumford and Sons, not the most authentic folk experience in the no, world. No, I wouldn't say <laughs> yeah. that. No. No, I don't hate on them anymore because they don't seem to ex- they disappeared off the fucking face of the earth or something. They did, but you couldn't get away from them in the 2010s. Yeah. It's, everyone liked that stomp clap shit. Hell, I, I mean, I like country and folk music, but um, yeah. that specific brand of like super energetic, like stomp clap. St- I, I remember Rusted Root from the 90s. Yeah. Um, or even like. And here, okay. One of my weird musical. You're you're a music person, so I can. I, I'll, what do you think of the Arcade Fire? Because I always had a really not I, a dislike of them, but I just never got it. You know, it always sounded like campfire music to me. To me, it always kind of sounded like uh, I don't know, could like a bunch of human beings spontaneously spawn out of a dressing room in Urban Outfitters. Yeah. Like, yeah. That very, that very, cause there was also like other like large scale bands, like the polyphonic spree at that time. But I like the polyphonic spree cause they were like a cult. And that, yeah. like, that was the <laughs> gag of the band is that they're yes. a weird cult. And yes. th- that to me was a funnier aesthetic than we are the, we are the like the bleary eyed 20 somethings who know about the desolation of the suburbs and were very serious about it, you know? And uh, yeah, I was never very into the, arcade fire era i was at that time i was still very in, engulfed in like underground like punk and post-punk scenes and stuff and music like that oh, yeah. well, like, like, AJ... like uh who are you talking who are your punk who are your punk people who are, who are your punk people? uh let's see like who do i like a lot recently uh yeah. the spiritual cramp album that came out last year is really really good they're like a six piece kind of like garage rocky punk band uh very very good i like right. the twin tribes album that came out this year sort of a post-punk dark electronica elect- like electro goth kind of vibe um those are like the two big ones i've been spinning a lot i like depression senora out of spain another post-punk band mm-hmm. uh just like i i Generally, I like either my post punk bands or like my like I like like piss jeans. <laughs> the noise <laughs> rock bands. Well, I, I love heard piss jeans. I hadn't heard of the previous three. Uh, like uh, just the uh, the reedy, just regular ass punk. We're playing some regular ass punk music. Yeah, know? Toronto has is a good exporter of regular ass punk music. We have Pup. Yeah, Very good like regular Pup. ass punk punk music. Yeah, they're great. Yeah, I love Pup. I love Fucked Up. I love that fight. You know, Toronto. We got some. I saw Fucked Up. They were great live. Oh yeah, Damien Abraham. He's, yes. uh, he's uh he's a he's a local hero, local legend. Yeah, we love him to death. And he weirdly appeared on that Greg Gutfeld showed a lot, which was very strange. That is weird. Well, because so here's the thing about the old Greg Gutfeld showed on Fox. You know how like Greg Gutfeld weirdly has great musical taste. Yeah. To the point where he was like recommending 100 Gex on Fox News, <laughs> <laughs> which is like which is always bizarre to me when a guy with like of a terrible politics is like weirdly they have very good taste in art like how it's always bizarre yeah you know tim allen collects tobin sprout from guided by voices paintings he's a collector of tobin no Sprout's that's art. weird and he's like a big gbv guy as he's like which is huh. yeah so weird yeah yeah exactly it's like what are what are you getting out of this yeah <laughs> how did this happen to you this is wild but, i mean that's the beautiful thing about art i mean i don't think I, 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 it's very interesting to me when like a, my, my comics are like pretty universal sometimes. And something when I have Casey on the show, I might talk to him about the universality of one of his comics, but may, may, maybe I'll avoid that because that's what everyone asked him about. But um, yeah. Uh, but that, that shit is um, that shit is weird. Like when you see a person whose views you do not like getting something out of the thing that you've produced. Yeah that's like a very strange feeling because you're like do i block this person do i want this person liking my thing you know has that ever happened to you or have you been able to avoid that i luckily going from punk uh i never had to deal with it much there other than like i mean you'll count encounter people who are on the same like you know political socio-political leaning as you but they're just like annoying or bad people (laughs) in other ways all the time that's totally normal existentially threatening to you 
No, no. They're just like, you just make like, me the guy who sucks in ways yeah. that have nothing to do with ideology. You're just like, oh man, this guy sucks. I sure wish they wouldn't come to my shows. That does happen. I have had that happen, but I've been fortunate enough that like, you know, yeah. our songs about our songs about like blowing up cop cars and shit are not exactly attracting yeah. a huge right wing audience. You're not, and you never gotten into a green room type situation. <laughs> yeah. I don't think you ever, because one time I was at a Cro Mag show. And then I quickly oh, no- I, I, I noticed that one of the fellows in the audience, oh, he's wearing an iron cross. Okay, I gotta yeah. leave the pro mag show. Yeah. yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> so sometimes in some punk outfits, they, they attract a certain type of aggressive person that can't tell the difference between you know any type of aggression, right? So yeah, exactly. So you have like dead Kennedys having to do Nazi punks fuck off because yeah. Nazi punks were coming to their shows. Yeah. Because they're doing songs like Kill the Poor, ironically. Yeah. And those guys don't understand that anything below surface level analysis of anything exists. So they're just yeah. like, ah, I agree with this. Very, very literalist people, the fascists. Very, they very, are, yeah. yeah. It's an ideology very, that kind of rejects nuance. It kind of has to by definition. Yeah. All you're interested in is the aesthetics of power, whatever yeah. that be and whatever it is in the moment. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's always like. Uh, there is some part of it so because when you do stuff that is more universally that you have like a comic that's about a relatable experience and then mm-hmm. you see like a very right-wing person going oh my god me you know <laughs> i did i did a comic about my dog walking in on me in the bathroom you know yeah i just i saw that today it was very cute yeah. but you know, that's like someone that anyone i that wouldn't preclude anyone from enjoying it you know yeah, I, I, could, how- I could show my you know my dad that who's 70 years old and he'd be like oh I, yeah. I understand that concept just as well as somebody who was, you know, 18 and living in a punk house does. Yeah. But as a result, it's like when somebody you don't like enjoys that, do you like, you, you are not allowed to laugh. You are not yeah. the one who I've, I've, so that's been like, um, and then in my fever dream in my thing with, well, if they laugh at this, then maybe, then maybe they'll listen to my podcast and they'll hear my politics and I will be so convincing to them. I will be so wonderfully convincing to them that I will be the converter. You know, I will be the <laughs> That never happens. That shit never happens. No, um, no, but it's a nice thought. Um, it's a fantasy I lapse into way too free. I mean, that's something that I also want to talk about streaming. Do you think that, do you, cause you incorporate you're you're pretty, you know, left wing online, you know, you're pretty mm-hmm. vocal about what you believe and stuff like that. Do you, mm-hmm. do you see any sort of like value in having a platform to promote that stuff? Or do you think that the entertainment gets too mixed up with it for it to be a value? My approach honestly is like, I, I do a stream that's uh fairly apolitical, but doesn't allow there to be assholes there. Mm-hmm. So it's like I try to create a, to cultivate a space that is inclusive and is full of people who are like generally left leaning. Um, but there's also a space where you don't you can go and like oh, part of when you're in the left is there like for good reason you see a lot of uh, amplifying of really horrible things happening in the world. So people want you know to do stuff about them. Um, but I do think at some point it is valuable to create a space that people can go to. Uh, when they need to like recharge emotionally before they throw themselves back into the waters of their politics. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I try to cultivate that. So it's like, you know, I I try to cultivate a place that is, uh, you know, friendly and trans inclusive, queer inclusive and uh, inclusive people of all sorts of creeds and cultures uh, where they can and create like a mixing pot where all different kinds of people can come together on their interests. Um, But I try to keep it, a little more politics light also just because like uh I, I while i do think politics are important i do think that if you uh let people go real heavy in their politics they start eating each other even if they're on the same yeah. side of the political spectrum yeah. well especially if you're doing streaming stuff where it's like the endless drama that's what it just becomes about is endless high school drama type shit if you're like arguing about minute menshevik bolshevik stuff constantly yeah and, and there's also like a thing i i try to avoid as a streamer um, it's like when you get into this, like these like politics react streamer spaces where they're arguing it's like left wing streamers are arguing with right wing streamers. And it's like, at some point it's like, okay, at what point are you guys just coworkers? <laughs> at what point are you guys just like boosting each other for both of your brands? Cause that's what you're doing. Yeah. It's like, oh, you know, I'm going to go argue with, uh, whoever and have them on my stream. We're going to debate. It's like, okay, so you're just boosting this person now. Yeah. 
like, like uh, the sheepdog and the coyote at in the Looney Tunes cartoon who clock in at the beginning of the day and then clock out at the end of the day. Exactly. As, as professional antagonists. Yeah, exactly. And like, so I personally, it's like, I don't want to give a platform to, you know, as somebody who's queer, I don't want to give a platform to anybody who thinks horrible things about dehumanizing things about me. Yeah. And so personally, I just kind of like, you know, we just ban those people immediately. Yeah, <laughs> like, as you, you know? should, fuck them, you know? Uh, yeah, so it's like, a space that is like i wouldn't call it apolitical because we're we're banning right-wing people and, and bigots and assholes on site mm -hmm. but uh it's not like a super politics heavy space because i also don't want the uh i have i have good friends who are you know anarchists or communists and they will eat each other if you put them in the same <laughs> thing so, yeah you know, I, I mean i have also i'm very like I, I'm not going to say my politics aren't incoherent, but I'm very not married to, I'm not an ML or an anarchist. I'm just like general, I don't know. Centralization is nice. We need more of that. Yeah. I, <laughs> I don't, I, I don't know how I would describe myself in granular detail or anything, but it, that to me is like, I don't care if you're an, I'm, I'm pretty inclusive when it comes to the various factions of left people, but people get really mad about that shit, which is, uh, you know, also just by talking about it now, I'm probably inviting a whole, a whole, uh, a whole host of problems on my head. So let's end it. This right is now. like the, yeah, this is like the most political conversation I've had in like years. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, oh, but yeah. That's recorded. <laughs> yeah. But even like, um, you know, cause it, it, the people you'll interact with online, you, you, even if you're not openly vocal about it, it's like, you, you know who your friends are. Right? Oh yeah, exactly. And I got plenty of friends who like, you know, are in like the political streaming space or the political podcasting space. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, a lot of those guys are great people and I'll like interact with their posts. And I just personally don't make it a big part of my brand. Also yeah. just because like, uh, people will be extra targeting and extra cruel to you if you're a woman or you are queer and doing oh, yeah. these things. And I am both of those things. So I'm like, all right, I don't want, you know, people to come to my house. Yes. That's you know, a real so concern, yeah. I, I am going to not, you know, operate super heavy of that space yeah. uh i know what i support and you know so as do people who follow me but i try to not like antagonize because i do think that there's a higher stakes for yes. certain kinds of people oh absolutely i don't think you yeah you don't need to invite that shit on your head either because you know i think yeah i absolutely agree you need uh spaces for people where um it's not just about comfort or something, but it's about, yeah, a type of low stakes socialization. Like we mm -hmm. were talking about, uh, I think before the show where everyone laments the death of the third place. That's why people can't gather anymore. The death yeah. of the third place. And these places become the third place and people need exactly. that. Shit. So it's like, yeah. if you can provide it, then, uh, might as yeah, well. Yeah. And I think there's know? a lot of value in providing a space that is not, uh, constant political warfare, but is also doesn't tolerate having like assholes and bigots in it. Yeah. A nice you know, curated yeah. space. Exactly. A nice curated yeah. Space for socialization where the process of ejecting someone is you don't actually need a bouncer, you know? Yes, exactly. Uh, you won't, you don't need to physically muscle out the Nazis who are yeah. coming at the door. It should be, uh, difficult. Um, but, uh, freaking, do you get a lot of those? Do you get a lot of like right wing people trying to invade the stream and like being being jerks and whatnot? I, you know, I have uh, not as much recently, but I had to down. I have to like downplay the fact that I am transgender to prevent mm -hmm. that. Yeah, because they will absolutely search you out specifically for that goal to harass you. Oh, uh, wow. like I had I've had people find, try to like find my family's home address, try to find my home address, legal name, stuff like that, like that. Uh, uh, very much is a thing that happens. Yes. That's really and, fucked up. Yeah. That, and that's why I, you know, I, I like don't dance in that space too much kind of thing, you know? Yeah. You don't need to, I mean, yeah, they, cause they'll, they will come these people are the most bitter fucking people on, or they got nothing else to do all day. And, yeah, and, exactly. And they will fix at your hatred. So you, you know, you have to be scared of these goddamn pepes. Yeah. And at uh, the end of the day, like I, I mostly am just online to have fun and connect with people who yeah. are, like things in common with me and they're to like do artistic and creative output. And, uh, I definitely am not online to, uh, get into some kind of 
like Metal Gear Solid 2 rhetorical information war. <laughs> and so I was like, all right, you know, that's okay. No, that's good, that's great fun. Uh, I'm sure there are wonderful streams about that, you know. <laughs> a lot of people like that kind of thing. And that's, they you do. know, more power to them if that's what they want to do, but it's definitely not for me. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I mean, I think that's the vibe that I want to do with this pot, even with this parasocial thing, or the reason why I do Twitter spaces as well is because it's, to, you know, I like not judging people, right? Yeah. You know, that's the yeah, and, and that's the problem with these right wing people is like, oh, they think, oh, you're the one judging me for my. No, you're trying to kill me. You're, <laughs> I need to. You are the one who is living in judgment of all others right now. You yeah. are the one who is uh, filled with a, a hateful exclusionary aspect. And thus we have to cut you out. I'm sorry. You, you need to be taken out because you are uh, fundamentally intolerant. And um, but I think um. I, yeah, I like being part of or curating something where if people come in or whoever's invited or whoever is, you know, d behaves in the in the nice way, which is very easy to do. It's very easy to not be a fucking jerk. Right. You just have. Yeah, to exactly. Not be judgmental, essentially. You know, I yeah. won't I won't judge you if you don't judge me. And um, yeah, I'm sure there's people involved in my community who if I knew their political opinions, I wouldn't agree with them. But they're not like raging assholes. Yeah. Bigots. And so it's fine. Yeah, we can you can talk to me. You can come here and watch our movie nights or talk to me about tabletop games or horror movies or whatever. You know, like it's yeah. as long as you're not a jerk. It's really like, that's my main criteria right now for like how I run my online spaces. Yeah. I, I mean, that's, that's sort of a revelation that I've had in not getting mad online. Cause I used to like, when I was a novice Twitter user, like I thought oh, oh, yeah. you have to Same. be mad online on Twitter all the time. Right. That's, that's what the site's for. And so you just get mad at people for bullshit or you end up like commenting on subject matter you're not really interested in because it's like, well, everyone has to QT dunk. Everyone has to quote tweet dunk this thing, you know? So I mm -hmm. have to do it too. And then I realized, oh, getting into arguments online is making me age much quicker. <laughs> it's making, it's getting, yeah. I'm graying at the temples. You know, my skin's getting terrible as a result of it. I'm getting mm -hmm. that hot back of the neck adrenaline feeling all the time. And <laughs> so I, I realized I needed to split it up. I needed to split my judgment of human character up into really shitty and regular shitty. If someone is just regular shitty, which is 99% of the time, what someone is being is just regular shitty. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It. Just ignore it. <laughs> you know, you don't have to comment on it. You don't have to think about it. Just ignore it. You know what it. works great? I yeah. found when I see somebody whose opinion sucks so bad, it makes me feel some kind of way or get mad. I just mm -hmm. block them immediately. Yeah. It works great. Don't have I'll tell to you do what. Wash your hands of it. Yeah. Don't yeah. have to, you don't have to get mad. I mean, I say there's some people who are great haters and I, if you are a professional hater, you know, I don't, I, I bear no ill will against you. There's some, yeah, like I, I my, my buddy, like, like, uh, will, he does Chapo trap house. Professional. Will Manneker. Yeah. A great. Yeah, hater. Will is a pleasure, he, but he has the temperament for it. You know, he's yes, he, does, exactly. he, he has, he's, he's chill about it. He can hate on someone and then leave it alone. He won't go into like a, a horrible reply argument with somebody uh, like over the course of an hour, like I will, because I have, yeah, stuff, you know, I'm too, yeah, I'm too, uh, passionate. I'm too like emotional of a person to be letting myself get mad at the stupid people all the time. Yeah. Eventually you have to it. just be like, Nope, we cut it off at the source. We just, yeah. We just block that person, move on. I start talking like Sephiroth. Well, I like exactly. Like, it's so easy to start talking like Sephiroth. You see yeah. what when you start talking like Sephiroth, you feel bad after, but when you're doing it, it feels great. Oh yeah. How dare you? Like <laughs> the it feels so good. Yeah. You. I shall burn you to a crisp with my laser. Yeah, I'm always that's my instinct though, which is why I can't be a hater. Because I'm bad at it. If you if you start doing the Sephiroth hating, you've already lost, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um but yeah, freaking, um, that is something I do want. I want to get better at hating so I can do it cathartically <laughs> in a cool way, you know, uh, it, but, uh, I don't think it's going to happen. I'm too, I can never be meaner than somebody, but I can always be nicer than somebody. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and the thing about it is like, I don't think in the long run, if you're somebody who is like, you're, you're not just a random person on the internet, you're a creative, you're making, you know, you make podcasts, you're making comics. I don't think it's the best thing in the world to build your audience off of fighting and negativity. Uh, because at the end of the day, like, you know, if you spend all your, if you get your audience at the Coliseum, they're going to cheer when you get killed eventually. 
Mm -hmm. you know like that's how it works like yeah you gotta yeah if you're a fighter you know unless you yeah. never lose <laughs> yeah unless you never ever lose <laughs> it'll never happen mike tyson was only he they only got beat a couple times yeah exactly um but yeah eventually he lost eventually mike tyson lost so there you go it sometimes yeah sometimes you just want to talk about the things you love Instead exactly and that's like where i'm at at this point it's like man yeah. i did enough getting mad at people online but the, i haven't done enough connecting with people over shared interests i don't think and i'm not sure there's a amount that would be enough of that i would like to just continue to do that for the rest of my life ideally yeah so like form real human connections because like what more could be the value of being like alive than that oh yeah i'm coming up to the uh, i'm i'm an old chunk of coal i don't understand streaming you know i'm 35 years old coming up back half of my life now and you know it's like uh, I'm too, I'm too old to be angry anymore. And honestly, yeah. I really, people fear aging, but it's got, it's good. You know, I've become so much more chill as I've gotten older, so much more forgiving and less judgmental and seeing the value and love in everybody. You know, it's uh, all that gay miss, shit yeah. they told me was true, you know? Yeah. I don't miss being in my early twenties at all. Oh yeah. I didn't know nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Make, making mistakes all the time. Yeah getting my ass kicked at like having terrible jobs, a series of terrible jobs where I have no agency because like, uh, I'm not going to do, I don't want to do entrepreneurship. That's scary. I'm just going to tough it out at a bunch of horrible menial jobs for a while. You know, I yeah, don't want to exactly. pursue what I really want because I have no se sense of self-confidence, you know, that was yeah. my 20s, you know? Yeah, totally. Other people's twenties were different. Other people were very confident in their twenties, which how, <laughs> how did you right, do that? That was not me. That was not my experience. Yeah, but no. Some people, my twenties was just getting my ass kicked. You know, it was like thinking I was powerful as a teenager and then confronting that immediately after college, you know, being like, wow, the world does not, I, it is not making room for me as, as yeah. I thought it would. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. But, uh, I don't know. Aging that's, <laughs> we, we, we've been talking for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, Amber, uh, it's been great to have you on the show. Um, it's uh, always great to hear from other creatives in the fucking creative space to get a little primer on this world of streaming that I don't understand. Uh, what are your plugs? Tell me your plugs. What are, uh, I, I, we know skull tenders, of course. Yeah. As so you can find me at, uh, I'm on Twitter at bloodberry underscore tart. I'm on Twitch at twitch.tv slash bloodberry tart. And you can find my podcast skull tenders on, uh, Spotify, Apple podcast, YouTube, or you can go to skulltenders.com slash subscribe to subscribe to our RSS feed. All right. That is great. And do you have any final words for us, Amber? Can you leave us with any final words? <laughs> I'm putting you on yep. the spot here. You really are I'm putting this you on the spot here. Leave us with a, 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 a catchy epithet. Are you never uh, invited back on? No, no, I'm never coming back. You're never coming back. I'm never back. coming back. No, you're good. You're obviously you have an open invitation. Oh, uh, I appreciate that. Yeah. No, like, it's just, I don't really have a snappy thing. It's just, it's been a pleasure being here. Thank you so much for having me on. Uh, I love your work and it's been a lot of fun. Absolutely. I love your work as well. And we shall continue into the future unmarred uh, by the hatred of the terrible people. I, yeah, I agree. I agree. We'll have you draw something for Skull Tender sometime. That'd I would love to. That would be an honor. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you All so right. much. Bye, everybody. House of Decline is brought to you by members of our $10 Patreon tier. These include Big Fan of Noise, Cher, Connor Lane, Constantine Bristow, Daniel Stern, Dr. Spichemin Zero, Fiat Lux, Height Concept, Jody Shen, Kevin Ott, Kimberly Latrune, Liz Heckmayer, Miles Forrester, Piscadoro, and Tor.